Now that we have the tools to build more complicated models, we have to ask ourselves what makes a good model. This is what we are going to discuss this week with model building. Here is an example. Let's say we want to model the relationship between a variable y1 and two explanatory variables x1 and x2. We can use a simple linear model with beta 1x1 plus beta 2x2, or we could transform one or two variables with a log transformation. So we would have log of x1 and log of x2, for instance, or we could add a quadratic term with x squared, or we could add an interaction term if the effect of one variable on our prediction depends on the value of the other variables. Or we could add a number of other control variables, x3, x4, x5, as many as we have in our data set. So how do we pick the right model? Well, good models share a number of traits. First, of course, is to see that the relationship is well represented by the model. For instance, we might find that the log transformations of our variables fit the data a lot better than the linear versions. In that case, we should use the log of y and or the log of x in our model instead of the linear version. Then the model should be easy to interpret. If you make a prediction, you should be able to explain why the model made this prediction. Then don't make the model too flexible, uh, especially if it's not needed. Don't add interaction terms or quadratic terms if they don't improve the model performance. In a similar way, don't add variables if they aren't needed either. Finally, make sure that your model can predict uh, well new observations. This is what we call out of sample performance. It just means that if we get a whole new sample of observations and if we keep our current model and the current estimates, how well do we perform in that new sample? So, of course, there are uh, tensions and trade-offs between these traits. For instance, in machine learning, we usually rely on very flexible models that are designed to maximize out-of-sample prediction performance. However, these models are usually very difficult to interpret, which can create issues when they make wrong predictions. We don't really know why a model made a specific prediction and what to change to fix that wrong prediction. On the other extreme, we have the very simple linear regression with only one variable, which makes interpretation very straightforward, but might not have a good predictive performance. You might get stuck with only a small percentage of variations in Y that can be explained by your single X. So basically you have a low R squared. When you build your model, you have to keep in mind what's the main goal of this model. Is it to predict an outcome before it happens? For instance, predict how many widgets do we expect to sell this quarter? Or what will the value of a stock be if the company outperform expectations by 10 cents in earnings per share? Or instead of prediction, is it to understand the relationship that exists in the population and you want to take some action based on that? For instance, by how much does an ad exposure increase the probability of purchase? And then the action would be how much should I spend on advertising instead of new product developments, for instance? Or how do doctor error rates uh, relate to hours worked? And in that case, the action would be should we consider limiting the length of physician shifts? Let's talk a bit about overfitting. Here we have some data points and uh, two variables, x and y. What is a good model to uh, represent this relationship? We can start with a simple linear model, and this will be the line of best fit. Or we could be very flexible and instead have a polynomial that fits the data very well, but can we trust the prediction out of sample? So for instance, so let's say I want to predict uh, what y would be if I know that x equals 3. The model predicts that our average y, our expected y, would be minus 25. Do you think that's a good prediction? Or do you think that the linear model would be better? It's hard to say uh, what the value for 3 would be, but I think the polynomial model is a lot further than the linear model. 
So this is a case of overfitting, and it occurs frequently when the model explains our sample very well, but predicts poorly out of sample. And this is usually a result of too many variables or too much flexibility, like here. Here, we uh, still have just one explanatory variable, one x, but we have a lot of flexibility because we have x, x squared, x cubed, and uh, so on and so forth. So polynom polynomial terms, uh, sorry, are very dangerous for that. And you can think of other things like interaction terms, indicator variables, all of these add flexibility, but might lead to wrong predictions. As a general rule, we want our models to be parsimonious. That means that we want to only use the terms and the variable that are useful to predict our outcome. For instance, here, uh, x1 and x2 might be very useful to predict the outcome y. We could add more variables, x3, x4, x5, uh, but they are not really useful to predict y, so they just make uh, the model harder to interpret. They might lead to overfitting if we have too many variables, and they require uh, the analyst to collect and process a lot more variables. So by staying parsimonious, we would have a lot of benefits by avoiding all these issues. Be very careful when you add other control terms. For instance, consider the following two models. We are interested in the relationship between the number of bedrooms in the house and the sales price. So you can use a simple linear regression where the expected price is just a constant and a slope times the number of bedrooms. Or we could control for square footage and then have price uh, being a function of the constant, the slope times the number of bedrooms, and the slope times the numbers of square feet. In the second model, the interpretation of beta 1 hat changes. It is now the predicted effect of adding one bedroom on the expected price, but keeping the square footage constant. That means the house is still the same size, and we add a bed, one bedroom, so we have more bedrooms, but they all must be smaller because we didn't increase the house size uh, at the same time. If you run this second model instead of the first one, you might find that adding a bedroom is associated with a lower house price because the houses with smaller bedrooms uh, might be you know, in an area that where the houses are cheaper or the houses might be older or another uh, series of factors that might affect uh, also the price and would be correlated with the size of the bedroom. So remember, every time you add one term to the uh, regression equation, you're fixing this term when you are interpreting the coefficients of the other terms. This week, we're going to talk a lot about doing variable selection in order to predict an outcome. So our goal will be to find either the set of variables or functional forms, such as quadratic terms, interactions, other nonlinear or linear transformations. So we want to find these uh, functional forms and variables that most accurately predict an outcome out of sample. There are uh, common procedures, and we've already seen one last week, which is the adjusted R square. In that case, we are just looking in sample at uh, the percentage of variation in y that is explained by uh, the variations in x. And then the adjusted part is that we add a penalty every time we add a variable to the model because we make it more flexible. So this is for in sample only. But this week we are going to talk about doing stepwise regression and best subsets regressions, which could be applied either in our own sample or in a different sample to see what, uh, how the model performs when we have a brand new sample. This is a bit out of scope for the course, but I want to talk a bit about machine learning. Machine learning actually uses simultaneously a sample to estimate the parameter and another sample to uh, validate the parameter against. This is why machine learning is so good at prediction. Most of the time when you're doing machine learning, you are trying to maximize the prediction performance. On the other hand, you lose most of the interpretability. So you have to uh, judge which one is better for your case. 
I want to talk a bit about the relationship between these various model building approaches and the dramatic increase in processing power that we've seen over the last 30 years or so, as well as the explosion in data availability that we had. At the beginning, we had in-sample statistics like adjusted R-square. These came around when data was very hard to come by. It was expensive to collect data frequently. Uh, data had to be collected manually, written down in physical copies. And so we would use all the data that we could to estimate uh, our parameters. We got as big a sample as we could afford to estimate our parameters. And then we'd look at penalized in-sample statistics like adjusted R-square and use them as heuristics to forecast how accurately this model might predict out of sample. Then, as computational power increased and we got more data, we could start running a larger number of regressions and keep a share of our sample separate to assess the out of sample performance. This is where things like stepwise regression became useful. Stepwise regression really follows a specific sequence to try to find the appropriate explanatory variables, but require more computational power to run all the regressions. Then computational power kept increasing a bit and we moved on best subset regressions. Best subset regression basically says, I'm going to check all the possible combination of my explanatory variables, and I'm going to try to find the model that most accurately predicts outcomes and finally, I'm going to validate or uh, evaluate this model out of sample. So that requires to run a fairly large number of regressions. We have a lot of combinations of variable if we have uh, even a few variables. Then finally, all the way up there on the top right, and I'm skipping a few steps here, we have machine learning. Most of our machine learning techniques use an enormous amount of processing power and data. Uh, but they are going to be the most accurate usually to predict out of sample. But again, you're losing interpretability and parsimony. So I wanted in this video to give you an idea of where we are going in the next set of videos. We're going to talk a lot about stepwise regression and best subset regression and how to do out of sample validation with these techniques. We are not going to cover machine learning in this course, but I wanted to show you where it fits within uh, this paradigm of model building.